And I remember there was times I was just so infatuated with a metronome and the timing of things. And I, we used to call my little brother Andy. We would call him Snapdragon because he had no snap and he was all the time dragging. And uh, <laughs> so I remember one time I, would, I don't know I was just aggravated. So I uh, I came backstage after after the show and I said, man, I said you were dragging, you know, you were dragging on that. And he, he said, no, no, I wasn't. You were dragging. I mean, just the intersection of good drinks, good music, and good times. This is Hops and Spirits Bar Conversations. Oh man, I am bundled up. The temperature has dropped. I think we're getting very close to winter time here in Kentucky where we're based. Hopefully wherever you are, you're staying warm, whether that's inside or outside. And we got a great episode for you this week. We, uh, For our conversation, we talk with one third of the trio uh, from the uh, group Flat River Band. We talk with Denny and Joe, one of the three brothers that make up the group. It's a fun chat to see where they came from as kids with a family band, now as three brothers uh, doing big things out there. And they've got a great new song out in record that you need to check out as well and for our tasting notes is it ever so tasty when we talk with kevin patterson he talks a little bit about those pastry stouts and winter beers because you know we did barrel aged before but you know that's not what's all on tap this time of year and it's always changing as we get into those cooler months as we want something a little heartier you won't want to miss that that's next and you know what let's just get right to it enjoy did you know hops and spirits is more than just this podcast Check out hopspirits.com for our latest episode release, past episodes, interviews with interesting folks in the alcohol industry, and so much more. Just go to hopspirits.com. Feel free to wait until this podcast is done. We're back again here on Tasting Notes with Kevin Patterson. He's the manager of the Beer Trap Craft Beer Store and Bar in Lexington. I'm getting much better at saying that, you know, two years later. I'm not stumbling over my words. He's also a Cicero and a National Beer Judge. Kevin, glad to have you back. Thank you. You know, you could just shore that up a little bit by saying Kevin is Lexington's most professional drunk. <laughs> but that wouldn't tell the whole story, though. I got to tell the whole story. Uh, it's a funner story. We like fun stories. This is true. This is true. Uh, And and we got some fun beers to talk about this time around, too, on Tasting Notes, because, you know, we did barrel aged beers last time because it is tis the season for that. But we're getting into the colder months, depending on where you live, Uh, maybe cooler temps, maybe it went from 90 to 70. Uh, But there there are other beers that come on the market this time besides those barrel aged beers that are quite tasty. But also unique. So what, what will we be seeing that are kind of different, but fun and kind of more in the season? Yeah, it's rapid fire transition. And this has been the way for a very long time is once you start to put away uh, those 90 degree days and you start to close up the swimming pools and the kids are back in school, you know, it goes rapid fire, Oktoberfest, pumpkin nails. We're soon we're going to see the um, harvest ales or the wet hot beers come out. Then after that, it's beer suited for Thanksgiving. And that's when the Belgians kick up and everybody's craving these darker, richer, heavier things. It's just like food. You know, whenever we're in the middle of summer, people want lighter fare sometimes. See, you're playing salmon. Let's do shrimp on the barbie. Uh, let's do more salads, but once uh, once that first frost hits, it's uh, out with the bathing suits, on with the stretchy pants, and break out the goulash, and we do the same with beer, and so now's the time for us to sort of say, okay, we're getting past Oktoberfest, here comes pumpkin hills, and it won't be long till we're wanting even more luscious, more big, more bold beers, and brewers, you know, they react to that very well. And, and uh, among those, you get, obviously, stouts, porters, uh, those are the, he- the types of beers you'll see, but We've moved past that, and it's not just a porter or a stout. Really, it's about that for every beer, it seems like. But this time around, I kind of get those, like I said earlier, maybe a pastry stout. Um, you know, you can get some, whether that's uh, working with the local bakery and some donuts uh, to, to, you know, all sorts of different things with maybe even some of the, you know, produce that's available. So what are those flavors going to be like for folks that, that are wild and different that they might not have thought of? Yeah, if there's a dessert in the pastry aisle or at the ice cream shop that you've ever heard of, there's probably a beer that's mirrored that in some way. And, and the Imperial Stout is a very popular uh, base beer for that because you already have those flavors that emulate coffee, chocolate, caramel, sometimes molasses. They are heavier, and so it's just a perfect springboard for a lot of other flavors that you can add to a beer. Some of those flavors can be natural. Chocolate's a pretty easy one to make natural. Mm-hmm. These fruit flavors are pretty easy to make natural. Um, but sometimes if it's harder, it has contained a lot of oils, which are hard to infuse into beer, like 
peanut butters. No, there's these extracts. And the world of extracts, in other words, flavors that you can put together in a lab, that technology has come extremely long way in the last decade. And so they can infuse the beer with these flavors really from going to the conditioning tank to the bottling line really last minute. And then again, you're relying on the alcohol that's in the beer to kind of dissolve those other flavors and prevent them from stratifying, even though there might be some oil uh, compounds present. And pastry style is a perfect one. Um, so when we say pastry style, in other words, we're, we have a beer that's laced with a lot of these same cereal grains that you might even see in the hazy IPAs, oats, wheat, things like that, some dextrin malts and all these other flavors and textures that go into boistering the flavor of the beer. So the body isn't just creamy, but you're going to take a sip. Is that, is that nougat? Like the stuff that's inside a Milky Way? Am I tasting that? Or is that shortcake? you know, pound cake, how big can it get? Is that brownie batter? Sometimes you'll actually have a beer. And if you try to drink it quick, like you do a Pilsner, you might die. Uh, <laughs> just because it doesn't go down as quickly, you will choke on it. And so they're definitely very sipping, savory beers, but they're not intended uh, to be highly drinkable beers. They're not intended to be beers that go down very quickly. There's usually a lot of alcohol. Remember, these are imperial beers, so the likelihood is that they're going to approach 10% or higher. So you do get a lot of unique flavors and textures that go into make this beer uh, like a slow sipping affair, a lot like you would uh, like a really intense hot chocolate or like you would a uh, a sherry or a port wine or those kind of flavors, those after dinner delights, they're really meant for uh, special occasions or after dinner rewards on a day well done. Uh, but today's beer drinker, they seem to drink them anytime they want. They come in fresh off the street, just give me four of those. And then I have to tell them to look, I'll give you one, but before I give you another one, I'm legally entitled to give you an insulin shot <laughs> because these things are not um, lighting calories they're not light in sugars they're very big they're very bold there's a lot of starch in these beers so if you're gluten intolerant then these beers are probably your enemy i was gonna say and it's wild too because we talked about this with the barrel aged of those unique collaborations you know four roses partnering with brooklyn you know goose island working pretty much directly with, with a lot of the distilleries to to showcase that and now you're seeing that even in this this realm uh the biggest one to me is yingling and hershey I mean, they, you know, it's now a, a it went from basically on draft and now it's it's out in bottles and it's out in bottles for not just a limited time, but kind of the whole winter. And it's kind of cool to see that. And you kind of even see that a little bit on the on the local level, where if there's a, a, you know, a candy store or a bakery or something like that. Yeah, even at West Six, they have the brownie uh, imperial stouts, and that's barrel aged. It's got vanilla and it's got all these flavors. So a lot of these common flavors are like vanilla chocolate you know sometimes it's not unheard of to actually see coconut well if people want the coconut they see in the barrel aged beer those nuances let's not stop in nuances let's give them a lot of it and let's make the beer dominant with those flavors i mean there's times whenever i remember whenever i used to use descriptive terms like dark roasty coffee like chocolate like <laughs> but now i'm using descriptive terms like is that mounds candy bar is that carrot cake um so i'm starting to use some, some terms like that to describe beers so i'm like i never in my world think is that twix you know, it's hard describing actual brands that you see on the dessert shelves or the candy store shelves and applying that very, very directly to beer because the beer really does taste like those things. And, and it is they are great. But like you said, you got to be careful because they usually pack a little bit more punch. You're also if you're going to go to the brewery, don't expect them to come in the nice tall glass. You're probably going to get them more in the smaller snifter style glasses. And that is to protect you from your, your, yourself most likely <laughs> and we all need that because if it's tasty you know we're going to drink it and I'll, it's easy to, and if you give me a 16 ounces i will feel almost entitled to to finish it. i don't want to embarrass myself and i don't want to offend the brewer so the brewer actually does me a favor by putting those big beers these six or nine ounce glasses and i appreciate that and and uh, like you said they're very tasty they're very unique so if you're looking for something a little different uh, this time of year, those are, are some really good ones to try. And Kevin, I appreciate that knowledge as always. Well, you're very welcome, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Check out Hops and Spirits on social media at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also find Hops and Spirits on YouTube and at hopspirits.com. Joining us here on the Bar Conversations for our conversation, he's one third of the trio of the Flat River Band. Please welcome in Denny Joe Seitz. That's right. <laughs> I, I almost, I, I saw it and then I was like, oh, no, nope, that's not how you say it. Uh, his brothers Chad and Andy could, couldn't join us to, tonight, but uh, but we, we got Denny Joe now. 
since this is bar conversations, I gotta ask, you got a good drink tonight? Uh, well, it's, it's not a great drink, but it is a decent drink. I'm, I'm having a little doers on ice. So. I like it. See, I'm, a, I'm an ice man myself. Got a little ice, but you know, since I, I figured we were talking to a trio, I bring a little barrel vantage out of uh, out of. A, well, technically they're out of Louisville, Kentucky, but the the whiskeys yeah. are kind of from everywhere. But it's three different blended whiskeys blended together. So I figured How talking to a trio that would be great. This yeah. one is interesting. It's uh, they finished the whiskeys in um, Mizanara French and toasted American oak casks. Then you know they blend them together, and it's not like their other ones because their other ones sometimes they do like a pear brandy and this funky wine and this like you're talking like three wild finishes coming together for a roller coaster ride. This is still a roller coaster ride, but I don't feel like it's as extreme as some of the others. <laughs> it's kind of smooth, or is it got a smooth finish or not? Mm-hmm. Is it- does it? Now, I will say, Barrel's been known to always go high proof, so this is 114 uh, proof. Oh. That's So, yeah, it, it's got a little kick on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they, they don't mess around. I think one of my favorite ones is their dovetail. It comes in at, like, 124 proof. So you, you, you better not be a, a lightweight uh, yeah. when, when you drink some of their stuff. But it is tasty, and it is a it's a weird thing because, like I said, you get three different things coming together, which is – I guess how you all came together, right? Three different brothers coming together. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what happened. I'm sure. I me, mean, actually, me and my older brother, uh, we're 11 months apart, 11 and a half months apart. So yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, oh, well, we're, we're, we grew up in an authentic family band, playing bluegrass and gospel music together. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, now you got Chad, and you got Andy, and yeah. then you got. Denny Joe, and it's spelled D E N N I J O. Were they it having is. a little fun on that, or play on word? How did how did that happen? You know what? It was it's one word uh, le- legally though. I've always been called Denny Denny Joe, one word, and uh, I get called a lot of names, but actually, <laughs> Denny, Denny Joe is what. And people say it fast, and they're like Denny Joe. You know, uh, and so when I was in college, I went to college. Me and Chad, we got music scholarships. We went, to, we went to school down in South Plains College in Level Land, Texas. And my music professor and my English slash English English professor, professor Shahara Huddleston, she said, you know, Denny Joe, you probably should, you know, spell that a little bit differently. So ever since college, I, you know, I have. She, she we kind of worked out a little something that looks more visually appealing. So I started spelling it D-E-N-N-I-J-O, one word, and signing my name that way. And I have ever since I've been at, out of college. So Interesting. Interesting. Denny Joe. Like- I've had people say Denejo. <laughs> Denejo. And I'm like, no, it's not Spanish. It's not Mexican. It is hillbilly. <laughs> Denny Joe. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, then I'm sure you get a few different ones with your last name, too. Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Now, are you just trained nowadays to just pretty much to go, uh, you talking about us? You talking about me? Yeah. Cause, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's why, you know, my, my father had a barber shop in, in uh, southeast Missouri in a small town called Flat River, Missouri. <clears throat> and um, we used to go up there and hang out in the, su- in the summer times, and they had a railroad track that ran past the barber shop, and we would hang out there and down at the river. And, and we got a little old, old enough to drive, we would go up there and cruise in, in Flat River, Missouri. And I guess about uh, 17 years ago, they changed their name to the town. They took away Flat River Man, or Flat River, Missouri. They changed the name of the town, and they went to uh, Park Hills. Park Hills. They went from Flat River to Park Hills. And they, they combined uh, a couple of these towns and changed their name to Park Hills. So we are like, you know what? Let's take that name. If you're going to drop it, we're going to take it and we're going to run with it. So we did. We, 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 we moved from Missouri to Nashville about 15 years ago and we started doing songwriter rounds and, and touring and playing out and stuff. And we started going by the name Flat River Band. So it, it worked for us, you know. Well, it, People it, struggle with the name Sites. So it's, it's easy. I was gonna say it's fitting for for y'all. You're all you just come at it a, a little different than everyone else. And what's it like playing with your brothers? I mean, is it is it dem, is it a democratic process? Is it a fun process? What's it like? 
you know what? It is. <clears throat> it's great. It's really. It, it really is. I couldn't imagine. I, I look around at some artists and even some bands. Uh, we've watched so many bands come and go since we've been in town, and um, I couldn't imagine doing it as a solo artist uh, because there's so many ups and downs in in the industry. You know, in the music business, there's so many ups, so many highs, and so many lows. And the lows can somebody sometimes be real low. And I couldn't imagine going through those low times without my brothers and uh, having someone that I can actually truly vent to and not worry about what I'm going to say, if I'm going to say something that's going to hurt your feelings. I know my brothers very well, uh, and they know me very well, and we know limitations. And and we learn to, you know, we're brothers. I don't know if you have brothers or not, if you grew up with any yep. brothers. So you know, uh, you know where his buttons are, and if you wanted to push them, you could easily. And so that's kind of our our situation, you know. We we know our but where the buttons are, so we kind of dance around those buttons. And sometimes we'll push them on purpose too. So it makes it it makes it interesting sometimes. But um, growing up in a family band, touring since I was eight and nine years old with our family, um, I can remember there was times that uh, you know we'd come in between shows. We were doing five half hour shows a day at Dollywood for for. Uh, for almost five years, we, we were doing every other weekend out there, and we do five five shows a day. And there was times between the shows, you know, because we were trying to make our shows perfect and hone in and, and make it the best it possibly could be. And I remember there was times I was just so infatuated with a metronome and the timing and things. And I, we used to call my little brother Andy. We would call him Snapdragon because he had no snap and he was all the time dragging. And <laughs> <laughs> so I remember what I would, I don't know I was just aggravated so I um, I came backstage after after the show and I said man I said you were dragging you know you, you were dragging on that and he, he said no no I wasn't you were dragging on it and it just hit me wrong and I slapped him and next thing I knew uh, shoot everybody jumped on me and I had to go we're a we're a family man you know I'm, we're gonna get back on we gotta go back out on stage and you know in, in thirty minutes and I remember going out there with a the, uh, busted lip. Because we had to play in, in 30 minutes, so I had a busted lip. My brother had a handprint on his face. It was just, it was wild. And But we've learned, the older we, we get, we, we, we figured out that, you know what, it takes, the older we get, the longer it takes to heal. So we, we're like, you know what, we got to lay some ground rules. No more physical contact. And uh, we try not to press the buttons if we, if we can avoid it, you know. I love my <laughs> brothers. I, I really, truly couldn't imagine doing this journey without them, so. Well, that's a smart thing. I mean, we, we, we're getting older and it, it's a yeah. little harder to get back up and it's, a, you, you just yeah. don't want to do that. You just don't want to do that anymore. And you know, what's it like, you mentioned you, you know, a family band playing at eight. I mean, did you have any other choice, but to pretty much get into music? I mean, was it family band or, or not? <laughs> well, no, I had, a, I had, I most definitely had a choice. I mean, I remember talking my grandfather into telling him I really, he would go to bluegrass festivals and they had all these jam sessions and things, you know, that were happening. And I went to a few, as, as when I was like seven, eight years old, I'd go with him. And I remember uh, specifically while he was jamming and stuff, I would go steal pyramid cigarettes out of the back of his van and go around and listen to these other jam sessions at night. And they would, and I would stay up all night long because these people would play in, in circles and seeing all night long at these bluegrass festivals, and and I remember <clears throat> thinking, I, I want to do that. I want to play an instrument. I want I'm, I want a part of that. And it was just cool. It was just such a cool thing. You know, these people were just they didn't care about anything. They were just caring about making music. You know what I mean? And they would stay up all night and do that. And I thought, you know what? I want to do that too. So I'm, I told my grandfather after the first bluegrass festival he took me to, I said, man, I, I want some lessons. I want to learn how to play the mandolin. My brother's like, well, I'm going to play the banjo if you're going to play the mandolin. So he took us both over to uh, Ironton, Missouri to get lessons from a blind a blind uh, instructor. And he, this guy was an awesome musician, but he was blind. His, his name was Barry Jones. He was from Ironton, Missouri, and that, that was my first, that was my first, um, uh, lessons was from a blind guy and he taught me kind of laid down a foundation i think we went over there for our six months and he kind of laid down the foundation and the rest of the learning came from 
uh, my grandfather taking me to these bluegrass festivals and staying up all night with these people and, and just learning. You know, it wasn't like it was a competition thing. We were sitting in a circle and you feeding off each other, learning different chords. I watched other mandolin players and, and guitar players and such. So it was pretty cool growing up in that environment. <clears throat> pretty special. By the time we were 12, uh, we were playing amusement parks and fairs and festivals all across the United States, you know. So, yeah, I had a choice. I wanted to get into it, but, but it, it, it catapulted pretty quick into something more serious than, than, uh, no, just a jam session. <laughs> or, yeah. 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 It catapulted pretty quick into something. We had a number one, uh, song in bluegrass gospel music as our family band. We've had two buses and, uh, before we even were the flat river band, we put out 12 albums as a, as a family band. So, uh, it was a little different coming to Nashville. Um, People would say stuff like, well, all you got to do is pay your dues. You guys have a good, you got a good harmony. You got a good show. You guys can pick. You just need to pay your dues now. I'm like, pay my dues. I mean, <laughs> dude, I played more shows in the last year in two week period that most of these people have played all their life. You know, it was a little strange to me. And so it made me a little bit jaded, to be honest with you, probably, <clears throat> you know, to the whole Nashville thing. Oh, yeah, you got to pay your dues. Especially coming from what, what we did, you know, as a family band, you know, we played at all the Six Flags all across the United States and played at Silver Dollar City for 12 years and Dollywood for five years. So it was just, it was a little bit different. It was a, our situation was pretty different coming into well, this thing. It's a unique way. It's a, it's a unique way. And then you, you was, mentioned it, you mentioned Dollywood and Silver City. What's it like having a residency? I mean, at 12, 10, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old doing these things. I mean, that had to be kind of weird in a way, but cool. It was, you know what, because I rode, I, I always rode all the roller coasters right when they come out, and I would ride roller coasters in between shows. I'm serious. There's times I've been late for shows because I was riding, riding roller coasters, I promise you. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a cool, it was, it was a super cool upbringing. It was cool. It's super uh, different, uh, just because of the fact that you know you tell people what you what you do for a living, and what, you know I was making pretty good money too as a kid too because I was performing you know at, at amusement parks and that. But um, I remember uh, specifically something I enjoyed about the Branson area playing in the in the nineties is late eighties and early nineties is something. Uh, a lot of the theaters, uh, they would bring in acts like Willie Nelson. They'd bring in Merle Haggard, uh, Waylon Jennings. And I saw all the because we had with our employee cards, we could get into all the other theaters free. And so I've seen all these guys at live, and I would see them go to their shows. You know, They're, they would do matinee shows where there'd be twenty and thirty people in the crowd, and I would get to see these guys up close and personal perform at a very young age and with 20 or 30 people in, in the crowd, you know, a little so intimate it show. Cool. Oh, it was awesome. It was great. You know, and they would play like, you know, they, they'd play like they're playing to whatever, you know, 10,000 people or something, but it was always a great show. So. Well, and you know, you mentioned too, like you, you learned from your, your grandfather, uh, your, your parents, I think were in the band too. What was it like having that multi-generational feel? You know, with with things being passed along, but also you know, uh, being with family again. You know, it it was great. I I, I often think um, I've got a couple of daughters too, and I, I I look at the way I was raised, and I think about all the time and effort that my parents got to spend with me, uh, raising me on the road, and that it's like I could never give my kids that much. <laughs> I, I I I kind of feel I feel guilty that I, I'm not able to give them the time, my kids the time that my parents gave me, you know what I mean? Because of my choice of, of playing music still. And, and, and then neither one of them really have an interest in music 
and Chad said this morning in a, on an interview, you know, he's just thankful that none of his kids play music. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it actually it gives him free time to play music and do his thing, you know. And no, it's, and it's because of the, uh, you know, industry's a crazy, the entertainment world, uh, the music industry, it's just, it's different, you know. You definitely have to have a passion and love it and love what you do. And we do. We obviously love what we do. We love making music together. We were talking the other day, and it really doesn't matter. We're gonna we're going to play music together till we die. So when we're in our fifties, sixties, and seventies, we'll be putting out records together. We might be in wheelchairs, but my alarm's going off here. But we we'll be making music together. You know. So you'll still be jamming and that, but oh, yeah. so is it, is it weird though that like not, now I know none of your kids are like into really music or maybe going the band route, but are they, do they have musical talent or did they go? No, no too much music in the, in the family life. This we're going our own path. Exactly. <laughs> they're not, they're going their own path. Yeah. My dog, my dog. Yeah. Uh, not really. Not really. I mean, my youngest daughter, can sing. She's got a set of lungs. She's just a naturally. Uh, she's a great singer. My, uh, my oldest daughter, back when we were playing in, in uh, when we were playing in Brand, uh, Dollywood, she would come out on her Christmas shows. My youngest daughter would, and she would sing some when she was a little girl, and we'd bring her out on stage and she would sing a Christmas song. I don't think you want her singing Christmas songs now. If she's seen this video, she'd probably kill me but no she don't <laughs> sing it but my youngest daughter she she's got a great voice she, she doesn't uh she doesn't do it a lot i think she may sing some in church but no no music <laughs> they'll, they'll listen and watch from a distance i think you know they're, they're fans and nothing wrong with that and you know, like you, you were talking about how you, you and your, your brothers, you know, came to Nashville, kind of decided to do this thing 17 years ago. How did that conversation come about where you're like, all right, let's give it a go our, ourselves and see, see what happens. Um, Chad came down originally, my older brother, Chad, he came down originally and started doing some rounds and stuff. He goes, you know, I really need some harmony saying I need some harmony I really need you guys to help me out with this so <laughs> I think that was probably what kind of nudged it you know, a little bit and we we sang on a on a regular basis he picked up a gig he said why don't you, you guys come down and commit to doing at least one weekend or two weekends a month with me and we'll do a two hour show at the Alabama Grill we're like okay we love Alabama and, uh, you know, that was back when the group Alabama had a restaurant and bar and grill in, uh, in Nashville. And I was like, okay, we'll do that. So we, we started coming down, you know, two weekends a month. And that turned in pretty quickly, evolved into having something every weekend. Uh, and pretty soon we were playing downtown and getting that grind and that mess. And it's like, ugh. All right, we, we just need to move down here. So we did. Andy and I picked up and moved down here, and um, we've just been going at it strong ever since. Uh, we did, we, 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 get, we finally got to a place when we started playing out in festivals, and we, did, we stopped playing in town. It just got it oversaturated with uh, players. You know, it just got oversaturated, and you couldn't make much money in town, in the scene that we were playing in, you know, you really just couldn't make any money. So we thought, you know what, we just need to start touring and we'll make Nashville our pace and start touring. And so, which brings us here today. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, a couple decades later and you're, you're still going strong. I mean, was there ever a thought of, at any point of doing something other than music? Um, You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, I was in the restaurant business for a while, uh, hmm. but uh, and some in the insurance business, but uh, just to help supplement the music, it's always going to be my passion to play music, and I'm always going to do that. Uh, you know, it 
it's it's just one of those things that I'll, I will always do, no matter what. You know what I mean? We, I feel like, I, I've tried to explain to people before that it, it's almost like something I was designed to, to do. You know? I feel like I was made, put on earth, to play music and sing with my brothers. So. Well, and that's what you get to do a day in and day out. And, you know, when, when you were growing up, what, what music were you all enjoying? I mean, I know you were going to bluegrass festivals, jamming out. You had the family band. But what, what were some of the things that you guys liked to listen to and maybe even influenced you to this day? Um, I would say all kinds of gospel music. Uh, but uh, I would say the Gatlin brothers definitely influenced us. I'm learning to sing three-part harmony uh, to all the gold in California. Oh my gosh, my mom, she wore us out with that. We learned to sing. That's one of our first three-part harmony songs we learned how to sing, you know, was the Gatlin Brothers, All the Gold in California. And which, you know, on this latest EP, we recorded, got to record a cut. Their first number one hit was I Just Wish You Were Someone I Loved that Larry Gatlin wrote. And we had the privilege and honor of having those guys on our record and singing on that with us. They were actually in the video and, uh, it was like full circle for us. I, I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Getting I mean, to meet those guys and then playing on a record after learning how to sing harmony and listen to them sing. Uh, yeah. It was like, it was full, full circle bucket list thing. You know? Well, and you got to record it in there in the same studio too, right? That's exactly right. We recorded the matter of fact. So they recorded that song in the studio in, uh, in 1975. So like, so 46 years, almost 47 years, 46 years later, come back and recorded that same song that was number one for them, recorded it with them in the same studio. That's crazy. That's I mean, you gotta give you like goosebumps, right? Like, I mean, this, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's crazy. And that was I their mean, first. That was their first number one hit. It didn't go to number one for us. It went to forty-one for us. But you know, it's a very traditional song. It's a it's a it's polarizing traditional compared to what's being played on country radio today. You know, it's a super traditional song, and um, country radio didn't take to it as well as what I think they should have. But uh, just because it is pretty polarizing. Uh, traditional song but uh i'm 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 so happy that we were it was a bucket list thing so i mean i mean was it did you just have to be patient because i i remember reading like you someone knew someone that could pitch it to larry and, and some of them and then you just kind of waited and then you finally got the answer <laughs> yeah you know here's the funny thing we went in and cut rough sides on it we cut rough sides on it and we we started listening down on it and someone said, yeah, you really need to get that to Larry Catlin. And, you know, he, Larry's got like two gatekeepers. So you can't just get to Larry. You you have to go through his two gatekeepers in order to him. So we found out who his two gatekeepers were and sent it both to both. And so he got kind of a double double whammy. And But he, he called. He reached out one day. He called one day and said, Hey boys, I like I like what you've done in that song. I'd like to be a part of it. I thought all the goals. <laughs> Bring back like every up. memory, every song yeah, you right? did to them. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is this is getting ready to happen. So it was cool. It was definitely a bucket list thing. What's crazy? About that EP too, you know, we had the McCrary sisters on our on our um, on our uh, EP as well. They sang with us on "The Sun Is Shining Through My Window," and we learned to sing a cappella a cappella songs from their dad, the Fairfield Four. Yeah, you know, they were they were the uh, black uh, uh, a cappella quartet that was in the the movie "Old oh Brother Where Art Thou." Okay. That was their yeah, dad. Gotcha. And so traditional, super traditional uh, black acapella men's quartet 
We learned to sing because when they would sing, their dad would sing with their in this quartet. They would have this rhythmic thing that would happen. It almost sounded like a train. You know, it, it's kind of hard. It's hard if you you need to Google it and check it out, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Pull up one of the acapellas on. There's just like this train thing that happens when they sing. So I was exposed to that at a real early age, and so getting to spend time with those girls. You know, those girls sang on everybody's records. You know, uh, they they um, they sing on everybody. They sing back up for Bob Dylan for several years. They were on tour with them. Uh, but uh, Carrie Underwood, they just did a video with her. So uh, getting them on there and, as sisters with brothers and the Gatlin brothers and us and us being brothers, it was like a, a big uh, family. It was a jam that, session. Yeah. yeah. It, it takes you back to the real what bluegrass and, and everything's yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was cool. Now, now, I know, like you said, you know, I just wish you were someone I love, didn't chart as high as you would have hoped, but you do have one that's working its way up the charts, and that is um, Ain't a Woman Like a River. You yeah. a lot of play right now. Can you talk a little bit about it and how it came together? Yeah, I, uh, God willing, I think we'll hopefully we'll hit top 40 with that one. Um, that song was uh, r written by my brother Chad, him and a fellow uh, named John Colgan out of out of Texas, they wrote that during the COVID. It was a Zoom right. <laughs> I think John had an idea, uh, originally had an idea, and he pitched the idea to Chad. And so what's, what we kind of do is once they get close to finishing the song or, or finish the song, um, Chad brings it to the table, or I, myself or Andy, whoever is writing at the time, brings it to the table, and we kind of take the song and arrange it based off of harmonies three-part harmonies and how we can present this song in the best way because uh, we know uh, what we're capable of doing vocally you know and so when you when you when you throw uh, that uh, genetic harmony or a sibling harmony on something it, it kind of it definitely it, it, it makes things different you know and I think in a good way so oh yeah yeah absolutely like the the uh, the last single we had shine through my window it was our first uh, top forty. I think it went to thirty eight on um, Billboard Indicator, and um, Chad wrote that song ten ten years ago, and he was singing lead on it. And, we're, and we hadn't we never we he brought it to he brought it to the rehearsal, and we kind of played around with it a little bit. It's like yeah, that's cool. And Andy brought it back up. He said, man, he goes, I think I want to sing that song. So Andy actually sang lead on it. Chad wrote it. Andy sang lead on it. And kind of, that's what brought that song to where it kind of, you know, fit his voice perfectly. And we arranged our harmonies around Andy singing lead on it. So uh, we do that on every song we sing. You know? a, lot, a lot of teamwork. A lot of teamwork. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> now, now, does that, so you, you talk about like how, you know, you kind of figure out the, how the song works, how how you guys can make it your own and you know blend your your voices together and harmonize when you're picking songs for for the ep how does that go i mean are you kind of do you all kind of go separate ways listen to things come back with a list if everyone's in agreement yes or is there a little bit of uh hey i like that one you like that one two out of three <laughs> it gets on <laughs> you know yeah kind of kind of you know it's funny because today part of the session we did today was just that very thing trying to narrow down uh, we, we want to have an EP ready by uh, spring and so we're working with Trey Cordley uh, I don't know if you know Trey or not uh, he's he's has a few Grammys producing and um, he's a band leader on the Huckabee show and okay. but he is a phenomenal musician this guy has a set of ears this is the first time working with him and so we spent the day today in this in the studio, uh, just hammering out, trying to figure out what five songs we want to bring to the table, and that, that was just uh, it was cool. I enjoyed it thoroughly, especially hearing an outside voice. You know, we put out seven records as a Flat River band, and um, up until the last record, we didn't have a. That's the first time we've ever brought in a producer. We brought in someone to co-produce with us. And so all the other, everything else we've done, we've always self-produced. So this is a, 
and uh, Trey is very hands-on, and he's a musician himself, and he, he's got all these great ideas and stuff running through his brain, and I'm excited about bringing him uh, to the table and kind of helping us shape our sound for this new EP. It's going to be exciting. Well, I, I read somewhere where, where you guys were talking about that, that sound and sometimes wanting to bring it back to those days of sitting on the fr- front porch picking with with family and friends. And, and why is that something so important to you to kind of have that kind of continue on and kind of even be able to showcase that? I think that, <clears throat> I think that, that will all, because that's who we are. That's in our roots. It's in our blood. That's what, we, that's what we've, we've we grew, that's what we grew up doing. So I think there will always be a, a even if it's a small piece, that will always be a part of, of, of what, we're, what we do, if that makes sense. That will always be there. No matter Absolutely. what, if, if our genre may, if it may, stylistically, it may go far left field, it may go far right field, uh, but there'll still be some front porch in there somewhere. You just got to look for it, you know? I like it. I like it. And, you know, you touched on it, too. You said you guys are back in the studio again, kind of working on some new things. So... Clearly, new music is coming, like you said, hopefully by spring. That kind of the goal if, if everything hits how it's supposed to? I would say I would say we'd have something by, uh, I would say late February, we'll have something ready for the push out there to go with, to start pushing for our 2023 tour. Ah, so, so back on the road again then, too? Yes, for sure, without a doubt. So, so what do you do in between? So is it just a lot of studio time, or do you take a little time off around the holidays? How, how does this time of year work for y'all? Uh, well, usually usually we take this time and learn new material. We do a lot of uh, interviews and that sort of thing. Uh, we, do, we do take some time off for our families uh, for Christmas. Uh, but this year, uh, in the past, what we usually do, and we're going to do it again this year, is... Uh, uh, rent a big cabin out in the Smokies. A big, Can't beat that. A big, you know, I think there's, I want to say there's 20, 22 or 23 people in our family. You know, it's a wall. Small gathering, there. small gathering, just a couple people. It's, yeah, and we'll sit up there in the mountains hope, hoping it snows. And we'll spend three or four days, you know. So we'll do that this year. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and when you're kind of in those environments, does, does every now and then a good song idea come out of there too? For sure. For sure. Yeah. It's inevitable. <laughs> There's always, <laughs> it's inevitable. When the three of us are together, we're constantly trying to think of, of song ideas, whether our family's around or not, you know. There'll be some good TikToks that come out this Christmas, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, are, are you getting staying up with the time being on social media? And, and just because I've seen a few of them, and it looks like y'all like to, like three brothers might have, have a good time. We definitely have a blast. We do. Um, you know, some of the social media stuff kind of wears on me a little bit because I think it's almost overkill. But uh, I was talking to uh, our publicist and a few other folks. You know, people want to know about your personal life and what's going on. And it's like, Really? I don't know about that. <laughs> Do you really want to know? You know? They might. That one fan, you never know. You might connect with that one person. Yeah, and I think, man, this is, I almost feel like sometimes it's like information overload. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You, I know you can relate. I know you do TikTok as well, so. Yeah, we, you, we, stay, we stay busy. <laughs> yeah. Luckily so for you all, you stick mainly, your, your TikTok stick mainly to on topic of drinks. So you get to do a lot of test testing of drinks. And that, I, so. I get to do some taste testing and it's quite wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but it's also cool to have, have conversations with folks like yourselves and get to learn, learn more about it. And I know you talked about, you got the new, hopefully a new EP. Maybe will it be an EP or a full album? It will, it will be a for sure. Any EP, unless something, crazy happens in December where we come up with a bunch of songs or something. But I would say, you know, if the music industry has evolved to where, uh, it's gone full it's, circle. It's, it's gone it's, full circle. It's single driven. It's single driven. You know, it's so single driven. People don't want to download the whole record. They want to get the song, find that song. I'm going to download that song. 
you know, they want to spend their 99 cents. And it's back to the 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah. So, so. I don't. I'm. You know, the return on investment on on creating a, a whole project versus five. I mean, there's a big difference. So, I think that um, I we'll for sure have an EP if if we come up with the more material and want to spend the extra funding to to create the uh, another five song. It, it could happen. Anything's possible. You know. Hey. It, that that is very true, and and then you said tour. So I'm guessing we can expect uh, more music. Seeing you guys out and about as as 2023 nears, and and then 2023, you know, becomes part of the calendar. Without a doubt, yeah. I figure, I figure 20. We haven't released our dates yet, but I figure 2023 is probably going to be um, our busiest year yet. I'm banking on it. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to. To some some new music, but I'm also looking forward to just being able to enjoy what you guys have put out because uh, "Ain't a Woman Like a River" is an amazing song. It's 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 great to kind of just hear, in a sense, some of that throwback sound, uh, you know, uh, that just you know stays with you forever. And and uh, I, I just love what you guys are able to do. And and uh, Denny Joe, this is a blast. Thank you, Jonathan. I pre I appreciate that. Thanks. That means a lot, and I appreciate you having us on. And I am going to look you up next time I go to Lexington. And, Sounds good. Um, yeah. We'll have a drink. We'll have to, yeah, we'll go have a drink together. Sounds good. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Find more from Hops and Spirits at hopspirits.com. Thanks, everybody. Bye.